Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the GIA Knowledge Sessions. Uh, these are a series of talks and seminars that are about gemology and they're fueled by GIA's decades of research. And at GIA, you know, we rise every morning and we feel so privileged and excited to seek and study and learn from gems. And it's GIA's mission to share our discoveries and our learnings about the world. So I'm really excited to kick things off today. I'm Kelly Giordano, member of the content team here at GIA, and I'm joined by Dr. Aaron Palke, GIA Senior Research Manager, and he'll be speaking today about GIA's field gemology program and how our field gemology contributes to our research for origin determination for colored stones. Uh, we'll also send a recording of this session to you later today, and that message will also have a survey, so we'd love to hear your feedback. And with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Aaron. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Um, so I'm here to do this webinar to talk about GI's field gemology program. And more specifically, not just field gemology so much, but kind of what I want to take the angle is the research-based approach to origin. So what we do field gemology for, basically. So take looking at this from kind of a um, geographic origin determination research approach. Now, why are we talking about origin and field gemology. Now, I would say that the problem of geogra geographic origin determination has dominated colored stone research for the last decade. You know, if you've picked up any issue of Gems and Gemology, which is the quarterly journal of the Gemological Institute of America, you've probably noticed this. I mean, you can take almost any of these issues and you'll open it up and you'll find something in there about geographic origin determination. Um, and it's really become so much of a, of a big problem and so much of an issue that this last issue of Gems and Gemology, we devoted the entire issue to this topic of geographic origin determination. And the idea we had was to, um, to discuss the problems with origin and the pitfalls that we oftentimes have, and to point out that geographic origin determination is not always an exact science, and sometimes it's not always necessarily even possible for a lot of stones. Um, and the other... The other kind of thing we wanted to do with this special issue was to completely lay on the table all of the criteria that GI is using for origin determination in the lab. So if you can open up and find articles about origin determination for blue sapphire, ruby, emerald, paribotermaline, and spinel. And in there you'll find all of the criteria we use in the lab to make origin calls for the stones that come in for reports. And if you haven't taken a look at this special issue yet, um, I just want to mention, you can go online to gia.edu and you can find the entire issue online free of charge, um, as well as every other back issue of Gems and Gemology from over the years. Now, before we get too far into this, I think it's important to approach the question of why is origin important? And I think to answer that question, you have to think about the, this other question of, well, what gives a gemstone value? And, if, you know, there's a lot of obvious things like the way the stone looks, of course, right? So the, the color of the stone, its transparency, the size of the stone is important, obviously. And these are some of the most important things, probably, for determining the stone's value. Um, but I think one thing that's overlooked sometimes is that another aspect of the value of a stone is the stone's story. Um, so, and I think this is really something people don't think about sometimes. And you can think about it in terms of natural versus lab-grown stones. So, you know, if you're going into a jewelry store to buy a ruby, why should you care whether it's a natural ruby or a lab-grown ruby? And I think it has to do with the story. So when you're buying that ruby, do you want the story of this artisanal miner in a river in Cambodia, and he's been digging through the gem gravel for days, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he pulls this beautiful, gem-quality, stunning ruby out of the ground? Or do you want the story of a, a ruby that was pulled out of the furnace by a scientist in a lab coat? And of course, there's nothing wrong with that second story, um, but... Obviously, the market's going to attach different value to the stone based on that story. And I think of, of geographic origin in much the same way. So why is origin important? Well, it's about the story, right? So again, if you're buying a ruby in a store, do um, you want a Mozambican ruby? Uh, you know, Mozambique is this sort of new modern deposit that's produced tons and tons of material, really stunning stones, beautiful, beautiful rubies that can match almost any other ruby in the world. Um, but it's a modern deposit. It doesn't have, you know, legend and lore behind it. It's not a deposit like Mogok in Burma, for instance, which is the ancient deposit where all the kings and queens were getting their rubies throughout antiquity. So again, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with either of these stories, but 
the market attaches a, a different value to the Burmese stone because it has this story behind it rather than the modern deposit from Mozambique. And I think to think about it a little more, we're gonna, I want to take you back on sort of a historical journey through the evolution of, of ruby mining uh, sources. And I think about it this way, for rubies especially, if you, were, if you were a king sitting on your throne 800 years ago and someone came and presented you with this fine ruby, there's not many places in the world that ruby would have come from back in those days. So, you know, if it was a really fine ruby with top color and good, and good quality, it was probably coming from Mogok because that's where all the best rubies came from in antiquity. Um, you might have had some stones coming from Sri Lanka, some nice stones from Sri Lanka, but the color generally wasn't matching what you would get from Mogok. Now, if you were to fast forward, the wheels of time move. We're about 300 to 100 years ago now. Um, a new deposit pops up. And this one is in what was then the Kingdom of Siam, which is currently located on the present-day border between Cambodia and Thailand, uh, in a place called Pailin in Cambodia and Chantaburi in Thailand. And actually, this was a really important deposit. And it was, it was kind of the first major challenger to the ruby deposit in Mogok. Um, the stones tended to be a little darker, but they were producing a lot of stones and a lot of really good stones. And so I, I think about it this way. If you were... Um, a gem person, a gemologist back a hundred years ago, if for some reason you wanted to tell the difference between a ruby, whether, be, whether it was a Mogok ruby or a Thai ruby, you would have turned to the state-of-the-art technology at that time, which would have been a gemological microscope, and you would have looked inside the stone, you would have looked at the stone's inclusions, and in most cases you would have been able to d distinguish between Mogok rubies and Thai rubies pretty easily. So in a Mogok ruby, you might have seen a lot of this iridescent rutile silk. We might have seen some sort of nested straw-like silk, potentially some carbonate inclusions. Um, the, the Mogok rubies would have had a pretty typical look to them in the microscope. Whereas a Thai ruby, you would not have seen any of these um, patterns of silk. There was no, there's no rutile silk in Thai rubies. You might have seen some solid inclusions with these geometric decrepitation halos around them. And it would have been pretty easy to make, to make the call between a Thai ruby and a Mogok ruby a hundred years ago. Now fast forward a little further in time, maybe about 40 years ago, and if for some reason you couldn't tell the difference in the microscope between that ruby, between Thai and Mogok, you could turn to the state-of-the-art technology then, which was an X-ray fluorescence instrument. And so this is an XRF instrument. It's basically a, a tool we use in the lab to make trace element measurements of different colored stones. And so what you would have done, you would have put your ruby in there and you would have measured the iron concentration of that ruby. And so if it had low iron concentration below about 300 parts per million atomic, it would have been a Mogok ruby. And if it had high iron above about 700 parts per million atomic, you would have been looking at a Thai ruby. Um, now, this, this is great, right? But the only problem is as time goes on, people start digging around in different places in the earth. They start looking for more gem deposits, and we find all these new deposits springing up all over the place. So all of a sudden, we have a lot more options for, that you have to consider to determine where a stone came from. Even just in Asia, we had multiple new deposits coming up and multiple important deposits, like the, another deposit in, in Burma, Mongsu. We had a deposit in, Luke, in Vietnam, Lukien, um, and some deposits in Central Asia. But perhaps the biggest thing that happened to the colored stone mining world in the 20th century was the rise of East Africa. All throughout the eastern seaboard of Africa, you find, found all these new deposits of colored stones. Not only rubies, but sapphires and emeralds and garnets and anything you could possibly imagine they had in East Africa. Uh, all the way from Kenya in the north to Madagascar in the south, including the important deposit we mentioned earlier of Mozambique. Now, like I said, this makes it more difficult because all of a sudden you have to consider multiple new options for origin for a ruby that you're trying to determine. Um, however, maybe it's not so much of a problem, right? Because as we saw previously, the state-of-the-art technology might actually give us some options for um, identifying these, these um, <clears throat> new deposits, stones from these new deposits, by having multiple data sets to work with. So if we look at what we have now in the lab, the current state-of-the-art technology is a technique we call laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, or you might see the acronym LAICPMS. And so basically what this is, this is a fancy way of, of um, saying this is a, trace, a way to measure trace elements in corundum and other colored stones at a very high level of precision 
and very high level of accuracy. Essentially what you're doing is you're putting the stone into this um, laser ablation unit on the right, and you're focusing a laser on the girdle of the stone, removing a small, infinitesimally small amount of material and putting it through a plasma and then in, into a mass spectrometer to measure the trace element chemistry. Um, in addition to this, what I'm showing on the left here, these are some in-house developed um, synthetic or lab-grown corundum standards that we're using in the lab to give us even better precision and accuracy on our trace element measurements. And this was a pretty significant endeavor that took years in the making to get these corundum standards to our, our five ident labs at GIA. Now, so let's see how this looks actually. So this is a plot showing some data from this laser ablation ICPMS analysis. This is for marble hosted rubies, so rubies from Myanmar, Vietnam, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan. And I'm showing gallium versus vanadium concentrations. So what, what you're seeing there is on these um, the axes, gallium PPMA. That PPMA means parts per million atomic. So what that means essentially is that we can measure this, this corundum, this ruby, with such high precision that we can tell if there's five atoms of gallium for every one million atoms in the ruby. So basically, if you took a million atoms in the ruby, five out of those would be gallium. And we can measure so precisely on this, this ruby that we can tell that difference. However, what you'll notice in this plot is there's quite a bit of overlap in the data. So we see some clustering of these Tajikistan rubies, for instance. You might have some Burmese stones that go up to higher vanadium. Potentially, the, the Vietnamese stones, you can identify some of those confidently. But there's this big overlap region in the middle where if you had a stone plotting there, you might not be able to tell the difference. And so this is, again, the, the situation where with the rise of all these new deposits, you tend to have a lot of, of overlap in the physical properties between stones from these different deposits. Now, the situation isn't always so dire, I would say, um, especially for what we call high iron rubies. And these are rubies from Mozambique, Thailand, and Madagascar. As you, can, as you can see on the plot on the left, this is a plot of vanadium versus magnesium for these high iron rubies. We're pretty good at separating most of these high iron rubies. And what, what you can't separate with laser ablation, ICPMS, you can typically resolve by looking at the stone's inclusions, as shown on the right. These are photomicrographs of inclusion scenes in these different rubies. And they typically tend to have pretty distinct inclusion scenes, which allows us to make these, these calls for high iron rubies a lot more easily. Now, I would also say that even for marble-hosted rubies, I don't want to paint a picture that this is always impossible because there, there are some things that we've been developing to help us make these calls a little more better and have a little more confidence in our origin calls. Um, especially, we're looking into the use of statistical tools for origin determination. So we're looking at better ways to more intelligently crunch the data of these trace element ana analyses in order to correlate our client stone with our reference data more carefully and more confidently. One of the tools we use is a thing we call the selective plotting method, which is based on a statistical analysis called the k-nearest neighbors method. Um, so essentially what we're doing here is we're noticing that on this plot of magnesium versus vanadium for high iron, for marble hosted rubies, we're only looking at two dimensions. When really we have, for ruby, we typically have five different trace elements that we would consider for an origin call. So we're stuck in two-dimensional space when we should be looking in five-dimensional space. And so our, the selective plotting method basically does that. It looks at the unknown, the, the trace element chemistry for the unknown stone, all of the five dimensions, and it looks at, in five dimensions, at all of the reference data around that unknown stone. And it, it takes only this, the reference data with similar overall trace element chemistry in multi-dimension, and it only uses those, those similar uh, reference stones in the plots. And so what we do is we can, have, can selectively filter out reference data that has dissimilar overall trace element chemistry. And what you can see for this example specifically, this unknown stone is this black dot here. We filtered out a lot of that um, Afghan data and a lot of that Burmese data. And we're left with basically seeing that this stone probably fits pretty well with Tajikistan, maybe with Vietnam as well. So all of a sudden, this has narrowed down the options for the for possible origins for this stone pretty, pretty significantly. Um, this is a tool we use a lot in the lab. We're looking into other methods as well, like linear discriminant analysis and machine learning techniques to crunch this data more intelligently and, and get more accuracy and confidence in the data. Now, one thing you might be asking right now, and I guess the thing I want to draw your mind to is, 
where do all these data points come from on these plots? Um, you know, how did we accumulate all this knowledge about or origin and the physical characteristics of, of stones from different deposits? Um, how do we know what we know about origin today? And so I'm going to just do a brief little overview of kind of the history of origin determination. And really, if you were to look at, at how this all started, you would probably end up with the Dr. Gubelin. Um, so Dr. Gubelin, Gubelin and his studies of inclusions, and he was later joined by GI's John Koivula, um, they produced these awesome, amazing uh, three volumes of the photo atlas of inclusions in gemstones, where they exhaustively described all the inclusions you could find in gemstones um, based on their origin, but also in terms of the treatments on the stones and you know, lab-grown materials and, and imitations. Um, and this was really the foundation and kind of the starting point of origin determination. It was these books that people still look at today in the lab when we're trying to make origin calls. The information in them was really fundamental to where we are today with origin determination. Um, through the years, a lot of the labs started offering origin determination services for stones coming in for report. So a lot of the labs since then started offering origin determination services for the stones coming into the lab for reports. Um, GI started this service in 2006, and you know, in many ways, I would credit R.T. Lidicote and G.R. Crowning Shield, two of the former leaders of GIA, for laying the foundations for a lot of the origin uh, research that came later. And it's a little ironic, actually, because if, if you think about it, R.T. Lidicote was really against the idea of offering origin determination services at GIA. However, I would say he is responsible for a lot of this because the emphasis he put on research and the, the research team and, and department that he built when he was leading GIA, that he helped build at GIA, is was really a, a power force for doing a lot of good origin services, origin research, once we started offering this service. And that's kind of when um, the ball was picked up by Ken Skerritt, Shane McClure, and Tom Moses, who further drove research into origin, origin determination so that we could offer this determination service more accurately for client stones. Um, however, I would say all of them realized that for accurate origin determination, a reliable reference database is needed. And so this is kind of my roundabout way of getting to this concept of field gemology then. So field gemology in many ways was created specifically for this purpose, which is to build up a reference database, a collection of samples with reliable known provenance that we could use to compare against for the origin de determination services we were doing in the lab. Um, so since 2008, when the field gemology department was created, We've led uh, 95 expeditions so far to 21 countries and six continents. So you can see this is an overview of the places we've gone so far, the expeditions. Obviously, there's a, a heavy emphasis on East Africa and Southeast Asia, but there's some. We've gone to some further afield places like Russia and Greenland, North and South America, and Australia as well. And so the essential idea with this field gemology program was to get our our people as close to the source as possible, as close to where the stones are coming out of the ground to build a robust and reliable reference collection. Um, <clears throat> and so we will send people to these places to get as close to the mines, we'll get, collect samples. We'll, because this is a, a real scientific research collection, we, we collect as much information as possible about where the stone came from, how it was collected, who the miner is, what's the name of the mine, the GPS coordinates, you know, what the miner ate for breakfast if that information is deemed important. Everything and any, anything that we think might be useful for us later on, we collect this information as well and store this with the stones going forth. Now, I want to mention on one thing that we get to this, the we try to p get people as close to the source as possible, and obviously that means that sometimes we can't really necessarily get to the source, and so this kind of brings up this problem of reliability of the collection, and so we've developed this classification scheme to kind of give a, a, a gauge of the reliability of a sample depending on how it was collected. So we go from A-type to F-type samples, where an A-type sample was collected by the gemologist directly at the mine site. The gem gemologist put their hand in the ground, pulled out a stone. As you can see here um, for Dr. Taosu on the right, she was at the, the Zambian Emerald Mine and pulled this stone directly out of the ground. This is an A-type sample. However, it's, it's not always easy to get samples like this. What we, would, we would like to have our entire collection dom composed of A-type samples, but sometimes you'll go to the mine and there just won't be stones to be collected that day. 
or sometimes you just can't get access to the mine because some of these gem miners tend to be a bit secretive and they don't want you coming to their mine. And so this, uh, this reliability classification goes all the way down to F-type samples, which were samples collected on the international market, not even necessarily in the country where they were mined. And so obviously this is not quite as reliable as an A-type sample, for instance, but we still have quite a bit of the, the collection composed of F-type samples because it's not always possible to get to the, the source. And sometimes we need to fill in the gaps of our knowledge with um, samples of different types of reliability. And so this, the entire collection at GIA is composed of samples from all the way from A through F type. Now, this is a, a photo of the collection that's housed in Bangkok. Now, the, the collection we have is mostly housed in Bangkok. We have smaller amounts of the collection in Carlsbad and smaller amounts in New York, Japan, and um, our Hong Kong labs as well. But the, the bulk of this is in, in Bangkok. That's where the field gemology program was really initiated and really grew. Um, it's a really unique collection. We have over 22,000 samples. We have over 1 million carats of material in this collection. Um, that's been collected for over 10 years. And so the, the fun part of the, or the exciting part of field gemology is going out in the field and collecting stones, seeing the miners, talking to them, seeing how they're working their processes, you know, watching people getting stones out of the ground and, and it's really exciting, right? And, it's, and then watching the stones go to the market and visiting the local markets. It's all, it's all quite exciting, but the less glamorous part of all this work is what happens to the stones once they come back to the lab. And while it's a little bit less glamorous, it's just as important as the rest of this because this is where we get all the information that we're using for the services, we, our origin services in the lab. And we'll do everything from the low-tech to the high-tech. So we'll start with microscopy. We'll polish uh, parallel wafers into the stone, parallel plates into the stone so we can look inside and look at their inclusions through the microscope. Um, and while this might be on the low-tech end of things, it's actually probably one of the more important things we do with the stones because inclusion scenes are really one of the dominant things that we look for when determining origin of an unknown stone. We'll look at various spectroscopy techniques, so UV-Vis spectroscopy, FTIR spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy for looking at inclusions, um, and then again the technique I mentioned earlier, LAIC PMS, to get very accurate and precise trace element measurements for these stones that we're collecting in the field. And once all the data is collected, we have built over the years this immense um, database that's housing all of the data we're collecting on all the stones we get in the field. And so the, the real um, use of this is that this is accessible by anybody, any of the gemologists in GIA's five IDENT labs. So any gemologist working on an unknown stone for an origin report can get into this database and directly compare their stone with all the data we have from, from stones of known reliable provenance that have been collected in, in the field, um, from everything from photomicrographs to chemistry to spectroscopy and everything. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the field gemology program. I want to go into a few of the more recent field expeditions we've staged, just to give you guys an idea of some of the things we're interested, interested in, the places we might be thinking of going, and kind of what we're doing out in the field and why we're doing it. And so one of the really important things that's happened over the last uh, several years is the rise of Ethiopia in the gem world. Um, and it was really, it kind of took the colored stone world by surprise because nobody was looking to Ethiopia for the next gemstone deposit. It, it would have been unsurprising if it happened in Madagascar, but it happened in Ethiopia, which nobody was thinking about. Um, and so they started finding these deposits of important stones like blue sapphires at Axum, um, emeralds down south at Shikiso, and even opals, which are a bit of an older d deposit in, um, in Ethiopia. And so because they, we had all these stones coming up so quickly and, and it really hit the market so hard, GI realized that we had to send a field gemology team there to get reliable reference samples so that we could come back to the lab and be prepared when client stones started coming in from these deposits. And this is a view of the emerald mine at Shikiso um, and a view of some of the stones we were able to collect out in the field. Um, and so again, a little sneak peek into what we did with the stones when we got them back. We cut them into these wafers. We look at the inclusions. This is a, fo a photomicrograph of a typical inclusion scene in, in an Ethiopian emerald. Um, unfortunately, this looks a bit like inclusion scenes you might see in Zambian emeralds or Brazil emeralds. These blocky fluid inclusions are quite typical of what you see in um, so-called schist-hosted emeralds. 
However, when we start looking more at the data, we look at the trace element chemistry. Uh, so these Ethiopian emeralds are shown here in this, inside this red circle for these orange triangles or the Ethiopian data. And we find that when you look at the total trace element profile of these Ethiopian emeralds, you can, in most cases, quite easily separate these emeralds from other similar emeralds from other locations in the world. And so it was really important that we got these samples and we got them to the lab to get the data to be prepared for when these stones started coming through the lab so that we could confidently identify them and not confuse them with other sources around the world. Similar, similarly, this is the sapphire deposit in Axum. Um, this is a basalt-related deposit, so these sapphires are similar to the ones you see from um, Australia and Thailand and, and Cambodia and Nigeria. Um, <clears throat> and so we start looking at the inclusion scenes in these, we start collecting the trace element data, um, and again, this is to help us be prepared when these stones start coming through the lab. And we've seen, we've seen a lot of these Ethiopian sapphires and emeralds in the lab over the years. And so it was really good that we had these data to be prepared for this. And the inclusions in these Ethiopian sapphires, you might see these, um, these parallel twinning planes that, have, that are intersecting, multiply intersecting parallel twinning planes, which is not so much typical of other deposits. Um, you might see often these clusters, clusters of zircons in Ethiopian sapphires, um, but you also might see things that are more typical of other sapphire, basalt-related sapphire deposits as well, like these sort of milky clouds, milky angular clouds of, of rutile silk, um, and coarser rutile silk as well. Now, if you've been following the, the problem of origin determination in the last few years, you probably know that metamorphic blue sapphires are really one of the biggest challenges for origin determination. Um, these are the stones that come from Madagascar and Sri Lanka, Burma, and Kashmir. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, they might have diagnostic inclusion scenes, like on the bottom right, you see some of these um, arrowhead rutile inclusions, these reflective arrowhead rutile inclusions, which are pretty typical of a Burmese sapphire. Um, in other cases, you might not see anything that's typically diagnostic. There tends to be some overlap in the inclusion characteristics of these stones and also in the trace element chemistry. And so for this reason, these deposits are ones we try to hit up. We try to revisit these deposits every few years if we possibly can, because it's good to, to go back and keep getting stones and document what's coming out of the ground, um, what's the production looking like these days. In 2018, my colleague Wim Vertriest was able to stage an expedition to Sri Lanka to go collect blue sapphires. And in 2018 and 2019, um, we staged an ex expeditions to Mogok, Myanmar, to specifically to collect blue sapphires, but also a variety of other materials as well. Um, and so, and this actually, these photos kind of highlight another thing a aspect of the field gemology department, which is we go th we go to these places not only to get stones to bring back to analyze in the lab, but also we go on sort of fact finding missions. So we go there to document what's happening on the ground, who's mining which deposits in these areas. How, much, how many stones are coming out of these deposits? You know, what are the conditions of the stones? What do they look like? How are people getting these stones to the market? These are all important things, and you might not think about it so much in the lab, but it, it is important to know these things in the lab because it can help you be prepared for what you might expect to see when people start submitting stones for reports. And that's actually kind of a good segue into the next uh, expedition I wanted to talk to um, touch on, which was a trip we took earlier last year to the Malasheva Emerald Mine, which is now called the Marinsky Priesk Emerald Mine in Russia, in the Russian Urals. And so emeralds have been mined in Russia since the 1800s, and they were discovered in the 1830s, actually. Um, and not many people know too much about the Russian emeralds, which is kind of a pity because it's, it's actually the case that the Russian emeralds have been some of the biggest producers on the market for several periods of time since their discovery. So from 18, the 1830s into the early 20th century, before the, the Soviet Revolution, the Russian emeralds were one of the biggest deposits in the world in terms of how much they were producing. Now, things slowed down during the Soviet times, and the, the Soviets actually even turned the mine into a beryllium mine instead of an emerald mine. But toward the end of, of the USSR, they actually started producing a lot of emeralds again, and it's it's believed that in the 1980s, Russia may have actually, for several years in the 1980s, Russia may have been the biggest producer of emeralds in terms of the value of the material they were exporting. Um, not much has been coming out in recent years, though. So after the fall of the Soviet Union, things started, uh, the mining kind of collapsed and not much was happening. 
but there are there's been talk recently in, in recent years of the re- revamping of this emerald mine and that there was new production coming out and they're starting to make repairs to get everything going up again. So it's always this question in the lab. We would see stones that looked Russian, but we weren't sure if, you know, how likely it was that these stones could be Russian because we didn't know how, very much information about production from these mines and what was actually coming out. And so this was one of the reasons that we went to the, the emerald mine in Russia was just to kind of figure out what was going on. And so we got to go visit the mine and we got to collect samples on site. And this is my colleague again, Wim Vertriest, uh, studying some of the production from the mine. We, we were able to, to get fresh production from the mine and collect it to bring back to the lab for our analyses. And what we saw at the mine was this big, um, sophisticated industrial scale operation. So this is, this is not a small pit. This is a big, a big operation and they're producing a lot of emeralds. Um, the owner of the mine said he had this dream of making Russia the biggest producer of, of emeralds again, and we'll see how that goes. Um, but these guys are really serious about it, and there's every reason to believe these stones are going to be coming through the lab. And again, you know, we took the stones in the lab, we polished them into wafers, and did thorough analyses of their inclusions and their trace element chemistry to be able to confidently compare these stones with what you might be seeing from other similar deposits. Now, specifically, the trace element profiles of these Russian emeralds tend to look a little bit like the Zambian emeralds. And so you might think that you might get uh, these two confused sometimes. Now, what you might look for then is the inclusions. And what you see oftentimes in Zambian emeralds are these sort of blocky uh, fluid inclusions that you see in this photo on the bottom left. Um, These are pretty typical in Zambian emeralds, but you don't see them really in Russian emeralds. Uh, What you typically more see in Russian emeralds are these sort of irregularly shaped fluid inclusions. You might see in Russian emeralds these um, thin films that have vivid interference colors when you use a fiber optic light coming in from the side. Um, And you don't see those really in any other types of emeralds. And in Zambian emeralds, you might see these sort of dendritic black opaque inclusions, which are not so common really in the Russian material. And so again, uh, you know, we went on a fact-finding mission, but the data we collected was also able to help us make these calls more confidently in the lab when we're offering these services on, on stones coming in for reports. Another thing we took advantage of being there in Russia was to go visit the Demantoid mines, which are in the same region of the Emerald Mines. Um, while we're not offering origin services for Demantoid at the moment, we're actively looking into it, and we, we collected samples on site so that we would have reliable stones of known provenance to help us collect data and be able to be prepared for that service if we decide to offer it in the future. Um, and one aspect of this also is that, you know, I haven't touched on much, is that these stones were also collected for heat treatment studies. And so sort of a, a secondary benefit of the field gemology program is that we get all these stones for origin determination research, but we also have now this huge collection of stones that we can use for heat treatment studies so that we can benefit the heat treatment identification of the stones in the lab that are coming in for reports as well. Because it's widely, it's widely considered that um, a lot of the demantoid, we don't know how much, a lot of the demantoid coming out of Russia has been heated at low temperatures um, which is, can be very difficult to identify. So that's kind of an overview of some of the things we've done recently, the more exciting things we've done recently. Um, to kind of finish up, I want to talk about the future of origin determination, where this is all going. Um, even though there are some pitfalls and there are some areas where origin is not always easy or even possible, there's, there's really not going to be any end to the origin determination services in the near future. You know, the market has placed this enormous value on origin, and that's really not going to go away anytime soon. Um, One thing that we are looking for, as I touched on on the previous screen, is we're looking into geographic origin services for other materials. So we're not only, um, you know, doing better research for the stones we're already doing, but expanding our, our services and our research to other materials that the market has a demand for. So in 2019, we enrolled the Alexandrite origin service after several years of of intensive research and collecting samples. Um, And this has been a pretty good success. It's joined the other materials we offer for ruby, sapphire, emerald, peri, bitermaline, um, of these other materials we do origin services for. And we're also currently looking into demantoid garnet, potentially opal, and maybe a few other materials for, for the future. Another thing that's going to be interesting to keep an eye on, and, you know, we really don't know what's going to happen with it, is that The future of origin determination is going to depend also on advances in technology, just as it has in the the past. Um, You know, we went from the microscope to the XRF to the laser ablation ICPMS. 
uh, you know, what's next, right? So technology is definitely going to continue to expand and it's going to increase our ability to make more advanced measurements to measure different physical properties of these stones. And so there is a chance that future advanced technology might give us some edge on origin determination. Um, but this is, again, this is something we'll have to wait and see because we don't know where this is going at the moment. And finally, another thing to, to touch on is um, what's happening with origin. So origin has been around for a while and you may have heard of this term traceability in recent years. And this has sort of become a bit of an offshoot of this origin determination thing in the, in the color stone gem trade. And this traceability is kind of about um, capturing a more transparent supply chain from mine, from mining to cutting to the market to the consumer. So um, <clears throat> basically having more transparent supply chains in, in every aspect of the trade. And this new service that we're, that we're working on is called the Colored Stone Origin and Traceability Report. And essentially the idea would be that a client could submit a rough stone, an uncut stone, along with documentation about where the stone was purchased, who it was purchased from, when and where. Um, and also, you know, these could be like invoices or receipts and this sort of thing. And then we would document the physical properties of the rough piece, chemistry, spectroscopy, inclusions. And then we would re uh, return it to the client they would get it cut into a faceted stone and they would resubmit the stone. When we study the stone again, if its physical properties all matched up with the rough, we would issue this report with a photo of the rough and the faceted stone, a statement about that the stone was, doc was accompanied by documents indicating where it was purchased. And essentially the idea is to get the gemological laboratory more involved in more parts of the supply chain for colored stones. Um, in order to kind of help give some more confidence in the trade for this sustainability aspect. And again, I'll close up there. I'm just going to plug this special issue one more time. Um, you can go online to gia.edu and find the special issue there, as well as every other issue of Jensen Gemology, completely free of charge. If you haven't seen it, it's a great resource. It's got all the information I presented here and way more. Um, it goes into specifics about how we do origin for all these various materials. And it has some kind of editorial articles about the history of ge or geographic origin and where we're going next. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you haven't seen it yet. I hope you'll tune into the session next week. Uh, Nick Sturman giving a talk on pearls. The fascinating world of pearls and shells.